years ago, there was an article, it was an opinion piece in Time Magazine called The Devil Loves Cell Phones, <laughs> which I just loved. And it was really um, taking it to today, like the devil loves technology. Mm. And what they, what they talked about in that article is how if we're not careful, technology pulls us out of relationship, both with our spirituality, our relationship to God, and our relationships to those we care and love. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think one of the things that I always talk to people about their technology use, is it pulling you out of relationships? Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We're here with you today with a very special guest, Elizabeth Griffin. How are you, Elizabeth? I'm doing great. Thank Elizabeth you. is a valued member of the Faithful and True team. She is a clinical consultant for us. And uh, we have brought her in today to talk about a very interesting uh, subject matter. We started our last two podcasts with Jim Farm, our clinical director, and we were talking about loneliness. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we thought it would be powerful to have Liz- Elizabeth join us for us to talk about how loneliness is sometimes addressed through social media and technology. Absolutely. And one of the great things that Elizabeth is able to bring is she really is an expert in um, the role that technology plays in our various coping strategies and the way it can play out in addictions. And so we did think after just talking about loneliness and the role that it can play in people's lives and how significant it is and prominent it is, that one of the most obvious ways that we try to escape loneliness is using technology or social media in order to escape into another place. And so for you, Elizabeth, what are you seeing as far as trends or patterns or the the role that it plays in people's lives? So, I mean, I think it's important to say that technology use is not bad. Mm -hmm. Social media use is not necessarily bad. But if we're not careful with how we use technology, it does tend to draw us out of relationships, which require a lot of work. Right. You know, a lot of being present, brushing your teeth, (laughs) taking showers, you know, I mean, being present when people are going through problems. But when you're online, it gives you this sense of pseudo intimacy, right? Because it feels like we're all friends. Within 30 seconds, you can find someone who will chat with you, or you can find something online that will make you feel better. And so it becomes this way to experience what we think is intimacy without any of the work of really creating true intimacy with our family, with our partners. Right. And you know, it's one of the great things about technology is it provides some sense of connection with very little risk. And in order for there to be true intimacy and vulnerability, there must be risk. risk. And I think that that's, we are risk averse. That's why we are so drawn to it. Plus, I think part of the power of like online communities is many times they have a shared interest Um, There's a shared perspective or opinion. And so immediately, if I show up at this Facebook Facebook group or I'm a part of this Instagram account, I get to be a part of something that everybody else likes cooking or everybody else likes hunting. And so now I can feel like I'm a part of something without having to fully be known. And I also think I know that viewers of the podcast know about the seven desires. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, technology is a quick way to feel included, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to feel heard, Mm -hmm. to feel safe because there is no risk. And so we often, when we're lacking those seven desires, we often find that technology can give us that quick hit. And while it doesn't last, it is a moment that you feel like you are connected to others. You don't have to be vulnerable. You don't have to take risk. And we're all have to be careful of that. But people who are already feeling lonely, feeling like they're not getting their seven desires met in friendships or uh, in their marriages or romantic relationships, they're especially vulnerable to this phenomena because it becomes the only place I know how 
to get at least some pseudo feeling of intimacy yeah. in my life. Well, and you mentioned the seven desires. One of the other ones that I think is significant is that sense of being chosen. Yes. That if somebody likes my post or acknowledges I, that I said something powerful or I see all these people watching my reel, then suddenly I get to feel like I'm being chosen by this group of people that are out there that maybe I just know their screen names or their handles but now I get to feel chosen because they liked what it is that I'm doing. So I think that part of the power of technology is it is a way to get some, in a limited way, those deep seven desires met. And I just want to put out, put out there, what we're also talking about is all technology. So it's any screen. Any you know, screen. I can I can own, I can be really self-righteous because I don't have any social media accounts. But the reality is my coping strategy is watching movies or TV series on any of the streaming options now. And it uh, just provides me with this chance of escaping. And I can sit on the couch and get invested in what's going on. And there is this sense of I am a part of something else, even if it's just as a voyeur, as I watch these people do whatever it is they're going to do, whether it's solve a mystery or be a spy or whatever. And so we have to be attuned to, it's not just one category of technology that we're talking about, but it's anything that encourages us to temporarily exit reality. Escape. Escape. It's, an, it's yeah. escape. So we're not present. So you mentioned this, and I think it, this is important. So we're not saying that technology or the streaming services or any of the social media opportunities are bad in of themselves. So what, are, what does it look like to have a healthy relationship with technology or the social medias? You know, there uh, years ago, there was an article, it was an opinion piece in Time Magazine called The Devil Loves Cell Phones, <laughs> which I just loved. And it was really um, taking it to today, like the devil loves technology. Mm. And what they, what they talked about in that article is how if we're not careful, technology pulls us out of relationship, both with our spirituality, our relationship to God, and our relationships to those we care and love. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the things and I always talk to people about their technology use, is it pulling you out of relationships? Mm -hmm. Are you forsaking a conversation? Um, are you forsaking um, time to reflect in prayer? Are you forsaking uh, time to spend with your children, really being present right. for your technology use? And, and we all do that to some degree. How many of us have sat down to family dinners and then we get an email or a text and we go, we have to take care of this? Mm -hmm. Or how many times have I said, you know, when my kids were younger, I'm just going to check my email really quickly. And then an hour later, I'm still checking email and responding. So I think it's a really common phenomena. But so I think one of the things we have to watch for feedback we're getting from others. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Does our spouse always say you're always on your phone? or you're never detached from your phone. Are we at a kid's sporting event and we find ourselves answering phone calls and checking email and texting with people? I mean, it's all those kinds of things um, that we have to be careful of and look for to indicate that we're being pulled out of relationships with right. others. And what's challenging about technology and the cell phone is the lines get so blurred because I can be at a sporting event mm -hmm. and be checking work emails. Right. I can um, get a text or an email on my phone, see the notification and feel this urgency of I've got to address it. And what could be true is to the other person, it is urgent and it's difficult to not respond when you see that it's from your boss. But creating those boundaries that say, and I hear this with a lot of the guys that I work with, that they try to create some guidelines. We don't, and this means everyone, we don't bring our cell phones to the dinner table. Mm -hmm. What that means is the kids don't, but also the parents, parents don't. don't. Whatever the technology guidelines are, it's important that the entire family is working with those parameters. You know, it's the idea that we're going to set this time aside and this can be our technology time. But it's with very strict boundaries and parameters. And you kind of mentioned to this part of the energy of addiction is we escape reality 
And so we don't know how much time has passed. And so I think, oh, I've just been doing email for 10 minutes. And then I actually look at the clock and realize it's been an hour. And so if, if I'm losing a, an awareness of my own reality, that's probably a good indication that I'm being consumed by it in some way. The field talks about the uh, psychology of technology. So we used to think that how people act and behave and think in the offline world would be how they would act, think and behave in the online world. And what we found out is no, right. people act differently in the online world. And time does feel like a different concept in the online world. We begin to feel like everyone's our friend, everyone's someone that we can connect with, whether we should connect with them or mm -hmm. not, it starts to feel like, well, we're just all good friends in this environment. It feels like it's this dichotomy of, I feel very known by people in the online world, and yet they don't really know me. Right. And so that anonymity creates a sense of, well, there are no consequences for my behavior, and there's no... Um, there's a lack of empathy when you're in the online world. So we stop thinking about all the people we care about in the offline world, and our focus becomes laser focused onto the online world. Mm -hmm. And all of those things um, can start to create problematic technology. Use. Right. And I do think this idea of um, not being present with myself in the online world. I'm not true to who I am. I'm not showing up consistently. And there's something powerful about that. If I can go into this chat room and blow it up with some opinion that may or may not be mine, that feels very powerful. Or I have an opinion about something that I have a lot of shame about that. I don't want other people to know, but I can go into this place where I have a certain amount of anonymity and just let it rip. That feels very freeing. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not connecting because it's not in reality. And the nature of the online world, the research has taught us that we all do this distancing and detachment. So we can go say something outrageous, but then we're like, well, what's that? I don't know that I said that. Right, yes. <laughs> you know? Like that really wasn't me or... I'm not even sure I believe that, but it was kind of fun just to say it. Now I'm detached mm -hmm. and distant from it. Whereas in the offline world, when you say things, you have to, people have reactions and you can't just click a little button and poof, everyone disappears. Right. They stay with you in real life and you have to then work through all the things that maybe are so easy to say and do in the, off, in the online world. Well, and I, I think that is such a powerful point is that, in the offline world, in community, in relationships, it's not just how I show up, it's how other people show up. It's their reactions to what I say. That inner change is part of what creates community and connection. And so in the offline world, I mean, on, in the online world, I can show up and I don't have to have interaction with somebody's reaction. Um, and there can be benefit to that, but the big cost of that is that also limits my ability to have relationship with them and connection with them. True relationship right. and intimacy, because really, where else in the world can you hit a little X and then poof, people disappear? Right. I mean, that's a nice feature maybe sometimes, <laughs> but it isn't how the real world works. Right. But it gives people a lot of freedom to feel like there are no consequences of their behaviors when using technology. Yeah. In a previous pod podcast that we did with Jim, we talked about this idea of loneliness in marriage. Mm -hmm. And there are couples that I work with and one person will identify kind of the hurt, how we're both sitting on the couch and one person is on their phone scrolling or doing whatever they're doing. And there's not this sense of connection that that creates isolation. Even, you know, I've heard stories that we sat on the couch to watch a TV show together. So we're trying to do this thing together. There's this entertainment piece and so it's not like this big, significant conversation that they're trying to have. But even the effort of sharing an entertainment together becomes challenging because the other person is exiting into their phone. And it shows up in a variety of different ways. I, you know, I always and I, you know, I will find myself doing those things. And for me, it's just always that mantra. Technology pulls me out of relationship. Mm -hmm. And being present. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes I have to do it, but I need to 
always constantly be thinking technology pulls me away from being present. Mm -hmm. And is that what I really want in this moment? And is this harmful to the relationship I'm currently trying to have with whoever's sitting across with me? It might be a friend. It might be a child. It might be my husband. You know, is this harming in this moment? Would I prefer to be present with this person or be away from interacting with that person with technology. Right. I, I would wonder, I don't know, I wonder if there's any research or if there's a difference between technology for people who are in some sort of communal situation, they're in a family, um, they have a spouse, versus someone who um, lives alone. They, they don't have children, they don't have a spouse, they don't have a partner, they don't have roommates. Um, do you find yourself, and this is just speculation, but would you find yourself more drawn to technology simply because it isn't, there is no other noise in the house? And so that's an alternative to just being there in silence. Um, or it really is the research showing that it doesn't matter that people in family systems and people who are alone and don't live with anybody else, they both find using technology the same. I don't know if they have done a lot of research on that topic. I will say that I often see clients who are very lonely because they don't have family or they're not in community with anyone and their technology use is significantly higher than mm -hmm. maybe, you know, other group members that they're with. Right. And it's, it can be, it's, again, it's not all good and it's not all bad. So the good part of that is you can find community and connection in the online world and not feel so alone. But also people can tend to gravitate toward that because it's easier. Mm -hmm. You don't have to leave your house. You don't have to take risk of meeting new people. And so there is a balance when you're in that situation of using technology to feel more connected and still realizing you need real life relationships. Mm -hmm. And if you're more of an introvert, you struggle with your social skills, it's very easy to kind of move toward a side that then the only relationships you have are online. Yeah. And and while that those can be healthy, you do need connections with real people. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the challenges is it creates the illusion of connection, which can be satisfying enough that keeps you from pursuing authentic to, connections. Right. It's kind of like um, you're hungry and so you eat a bag of potato chips. You feel full and yet you're not getting any nutritional value from that, but you feel satisfied for a while. Well, I think online connections when we're doing it out of that unhealthy place is like eating potato chips versus eating a nutritious meal. But if I'm full, even if it's with junk food, I'm not going to then be more interested in the nutritional meal. Right. So right. there is kind of a, a cost even to... The fact that the more I do it, the less I may be interested in those authentic connections because I'm satisfied. Enough. Right. Because and it's so easy. Right. Um, I do think that technology can often work toward enhancing some of our offline relationships. Mm -hmm. When my boys were teenagers, you know, I could text with them and they would tell me things over text that it would be like pulling teeth to get out of them. Like, oh, I'm really worried about this test or I'm really worried about this. But in text, and so we could have some great conversations right. over text. Or um, I have a son who is out of the country right now, so we're not talking every day, but I can text and feel really connected with him. Mm -hmm. Or if your spouse is out of town. So it's not that technology can't connect us in some ways. We we just can't let that become the primary way we connect with anyone. But what if we say that what technology can do is enhance and affirm connection and intimacy that is already there? There's already a foundation of connection, and this is just enhancing that with greater accessibility right. or more opportunity. What it can't do is create that deeper connection if that is the only thing that you have. And we've said it, but I think we will, I want to say it again. Wise men and women use technology to enhance their lives. You know, mm -hmm. they use it to get fun recipes. They use it to meet other people. They use it to 
um, challenge themselves. So technology can be a way to um, enhance whatever it is that you're interested in and in relationships that you have. What's also true is that survivor part of us, that shadowy mm -hmm. part of us can also use it. So we're back to that idea. It's not about using it. It's about what part of us is using it and why we are using it. And I would say that it, it has the possibility, if stewarded well, to help us in our loneliness. Yes. But in our laziness, yes. many times what it does is it intensifies our loneliness. Right. And, beco and becomes an escape. And so we are gravitated to, toward those relationships that really take us away from addressing our issues and make it easy for that hour we're chatting online. And then when we return to the real world, we're still lonely or now we have to face the consequences of who mm -hmm. we were chatting with and what we were saying. Right. Yeah. And part of the deal is if I end my time online and I still feel good about who I am, I was congruent and I can enter into my offline world with authenticity and integrity, then that's a good indication that I had stewarded it well. But after my experience online, if I have regret, if I have mm -hmm. shame, maybe I have greater fear if you're hiding the behavior. Yes. Yeah. If I feel like I have to do this in secret, that's probably a good indication that you're not stewarding it in a way that's going to be helpful. Yes. I would definitely agree with that. Is there anything that, um, any encouragement that you would give? Because maybe there are people that are listening that would say, you know what? I am lonely and I do try to use technology to rescue me out of my loneliness. Is there any coaching that you would give someone on how to begin maybe to steward it better that moves them out of loneliness, maybe into authentic community and connection? Again, I, it, it's not anything that's really complicated. It's about finding places in the real world to connect, whether that is a faith-based community, mm -hmm. whether that is some type of hobby or class. And I know it's really difficult to take that first step by yourself. So maybe it is about looking around to people that you know and asking them to join you mm -hmm. in an activity and where is their faith community. Um, typically, faith communities can be very welcoming places um, for people who really feel like um, they're out of control with their technology behavior. Um, an S group, you know, maybe their behavior isn't necessarily out of control sexually, or maybe they're not doing sexual things, but almost any uh, SA, SAA mm -hmm. group has people who are struggling with their technology right. use and who can be helpful in finding community. Um, am I accurate that technology addiction is becoming a identifiable diagnosis or yes. is being discussed or it is official? I believe it has now, but it is one that will be going into the DSM, internet addiction. Okay. I don't know that it's going into the U.S. Diagnostic Manual, but it is going into the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD-10, or 11, I'm sorry. And it is the like the diagnostic manual for the entire world, except the U.S. Mm -hmm. We have our own. Right. We're special. <laughs> but we're special, I know. Um, so it is going to be a disorder that's going to be listed in the ICD-11 when it comes out next year. Year, I think. And, and I, I, I hope that for someone who has been questioning their relationship with technology, instead of that diagnosis being a message of shame, it's actually a message of hope. You know, one of the things that we talk about here, you know, with our men, if you look at the criteria that we talk about, if you have some of the components of the addiction, that if you come to the conclusion that you do struggle with sexual addiction, Instead of that being about shame, let that be about hope. Because what we know is if you have the proper diagnosis and there's a treatment plan and you follow that treatment plan, it can lead you to freedom. And I would say the same thing is true here. My guess is there's support. There are groups. There are um, counselors and therapists that can help with that so that you don't have to be stuck. Because what we do know is the nature of addiction is it leads us out of intimacy and healthy relationships into shame and isolation. isolation. And so if you would say, oh, I do think that I have some addiction energy around technology, 
to be able to get the support that you need to move back into an authentic sense of community and connection with others. And it is such a common problem. Like I really don't know anyone in my personal or professional life who couldn't use a little help around right. their technology use. I mean, yes. really, yeah. I mean, it is not like an issue that that is not really common right. and that most everyone struggles with to some degree or another or at some point in their life or right. another. Yeah. You know, one, one of the practices is if you have something in your life that you're concerned that you may have an unhealthy dependence on, is to take a season and not participate in that. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, there are many people from a religious tradition that um, celebrates and recognizes Lent. There is now a movement for the season of Lent to give up technology in a particular way. I mean, you may not be able to give up your cell phone. You may need to use it for business or whatever. But you may say, you know what, for this particular season, for the next month, for the next two months, I'm intentionally not going to use my social media during this time frame, or I'm going to not visit my account just to see what your reaction is. Because one of the best ways we can know what our relationship is to something is if we remove it temporarily. And that may give somebody some clarity of how they're using it that may be moving them into isolation rather that because the illusion is, oh, I feel so connected to everybody because of this. And by removing it, they may get some clarity around that. I uh, I just had to laugh. So I think everybody should listen to what Greg said one more time <laughs> as you were talking. And I was thinking about giving up my technology. My anxiety was just <laughs> going rising. sky high. I was like, huh. Like, so every, I, I think it would yeah. be good for people to re-listen to that part of the podcast. And that's a little diagnostic uh, right. moment to determine <laughs> If your anxiety started to increase and even just thinking about giving up some aspect of your technology yeah. use. And it doesn't have to be a big ask. It can be for 24 hours. It can be for a week. Just to, again, it's four more, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever is possible. It's about giving yourself more information and more clarity. Yeah. And, and again, the whole idea of this is we see the value and the, the nature of community as foundational. That if I'm going to be well... Um, according to the scripture, I need to be in a healthy community. And so there's, this is so much more than just having friendships. This is about really living into and becoming the person that God created me to be. And in order to do that, it's got to be in the context of good, safe, safe. community. Community really is the solution to so much of the issue of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And if people can find community, then they're going to discover that all of their addictive behaviors, whether it's maybe technology use or sex or alcohol, are going to start to decrease if you can find help, healthy community. Mm -hmm. Perfect point to end on. <laughs> Great timing on that. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for You're being welcome. with us today. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up podcast that uh, will follow this, uh, but we hope that those who have been listening and watching uh, have benefited from this uh, very beneficial uh, message today. If you have uh, come to the realization that you could use our help, we invite you to visit our website, faithfulandtrue.com, where you'll find many resources and you'll find over 400 podcasts like this one uh, under a wide variety of subject matter. We have also our online bookstore with all of the books by Mark and Debbie Laser, and we invite you to take a look at that, as well as all the information and online registration uh, capabilities for our three-day intensive workshops. We have the Men's Journey Workshop that we offer every month uh, for men. And then we have the women's journey workshop for the spouses. And then we have two different uh, couples journey workshops uh, that are now available. And all the information about those events are available on the website. So in the meantime, until we join you again next time, we thank you for listening, for watching. We hope that this coming week will be a week for you that's filled with many blessings and with a great vision.